Susan Wright, Republican candidate for the 6th Congressional District in Texas. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, soon after your husband, Congressman Ron Wright, who passed away earlier this year, uh, you came out and decided to run. Um, why is that and how difficult a decision was that for you? Well, Jack, thank you for having me today. Uh, that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do is to decide to do this, but it was important to me to uh, carry on Ron's legacy, to have a, a representative in Washington who would be focused on the district from a grassroots um, community-based standpoint. Uh, that's what Ron did, that's what I valued in his, um, in his representation, and that's what I intend to do as well. And I had so many people come to me and encourage me to do this. They felt my voice was needed, and um, I took a few looks at it and studied it a bit, and uh, obviously I came to the conclusion to run. I think it's important to have someone who's from the district, who knows the district, who knows the people, and who lives here. This is my home, this is my community, and what we do matters. And so for that reason, I'd like to take that voice to Washington. And was this, so was, this was a decision made completely after the fact? You never had any conversations uh, with the congressman about this situation? The, the only conversation we had was on Friday night, Saturday morning, when he recognized he, he had taken a dramatic turn for the worst. And uh, he said, you know, if he didn't come home with me, that I should take a strong look at, at, uh, at, at running for this seat. But other than that, no, this was nothing I'd ever planned on doing. Um, he was my favorite congressman, and he, I was perfectly happy to have him uh, continue in that. And we're very sorry about what happened. Um, let me ask you, why do you believe you are the best candidate? Well, I think because I've got 30 years experience living, working, and uh, being active in this community. And uh, because I was with Ron every step of the way from his city council days and campaigns throughout his time as district director for, for this sixth district, then his time as a member of Congress, I've worked with him throughout the district. So I know the district, I know the people. I've uh, been a district director for two state representatives. So I'm very familiar with constituent services and acting on behalf of constituents, my neighbors, to uh, access the services that they need, that they deserve from their government. And as a community volunteer, I've been active uh, civically and with nonprofits to try and improve the community that I live in. I've been um, active in preg crisis pregnancy and uh, women's uh, crisis centers. I've been active with United Way probably 20 years ago on a families panel in the leadership position. And I'm serving currently with uh, the chamber in both the city of Ar both Arlington Chamber and Mansfield Chamber on public policy advisory committees. So I've, I've done a, a wide array of, of, uh, of things that help me connect to the people around me and I've had a great deal of success in connecting them to their government to resolve their problems. And I think that's the voice that we need in Washington and I would like to be that voice to do that. And if you win, what are your priorities? Well, my first priority is going to be to work to solve the crisis at the border. We have to secure the border. We have to address the humanitarian crisis that exists down there. Secondly, I'm very serious about addressing the debt we have as a nation. That is my grandchildren and their children's money. It's mine and your money, Jack, that we're spending that we don't have. And so, uh, we have to address that at some point. That's not gonna be an easy fix. It's not gonna be an easy conversation, but those are two things that I'm absolutely committed to doing as soon as I get there. Regarding the border, what would be your proposed solution or what have you heard that you think would go a long way in uh, preventing what we're seeing now? Well, I think that we, we had a good solution in place uh, in January, the, uh, President Trump was successful in working with Mexico to uh, create a situation at the border where people coming for asylum would wait in Mexico while their cases were adjudicated in a very humane situation, certainly better than what we have right now. What we have right now is, is, uh, is a failure, frankly, of us to secure our southern border. It's become an economic crisis in addition to the humanitarian crisis. It's become a national security crisis. And it is, it is a horrible condition for these people to live in. 
who are coming up here for a better way of life. They, they uh, endure quite a, a treacherous path up here. And then when they get here, it's at least as bad in some accounts worse than the situations that they left. So we have got to address that. We have got to, we have got to secure the border. We have got to step, stop messaging that people can come up here, get into the United States, and they don't have to uh, go through the, the process. That is not uh, accurate, and it is certainly not fair to the people who are going through the process for um, naturalization and asylum, who have waited in line and done what they're supposed to do. So I think we've got to get back to that. Ultimately, though, doesn't this really come down to the Congress taking action? We've been through how many different uh, presidential administrations and court cases and yet nothing seems to have to change. So isn't this really the time where congressional leaders and members of Congress are gonna to have to press this, you know, get into a room and don't come out until, you know, there's an agreement? Well, I think you're exactly right. The part of the problem we have today is because so many band-aids have put on this system. Look, the immigration system has not, the, the immigration criteria, and um, numbers that we use for who can come in and, and what reason, those haven't been updated in decades. And it's a complicated, it's a complicated issue. It's a hard conversation. And it's, um, we are reluctant as a nation to have that conversation, I think. But I believe the time has come where we absolutely have to. We're not doing anyone any favors with what we have going on at the southern border. Not the people who are fleeing the desperate situations from which they, they come. Not the people at the southern border who live here. Our American brothers and sisters who are trying their best to live a life, but they're being overrun by people who are desperate to get in here and people who wish us ill. There's a lot of bad acting going on down there in addition to people just desperate for a better way of life. So I think at some point we do have to do exactly as you said, we have to go into a room, we have to have the hard conversations and we have to come up with something that uh, works. I think we can do it. Look, I don't believe there's a problem that exists that the American people can't sit down and solve. And I'm confident that when we put our minds to it, we can do it. And I'd like to be at that table when we do it. I wanted to follow up on your other priority on getting the nation's debt uh, reduced. What is your solution? I mean, because there is either, you know, cut spending, uh, you know, some say raise taxes. So where are you on all this? Well, I think this is time for uh, some grown-up talk, right? There's no way to sustain what we're doing. We cannot continue to spend money we don't have. Uh, I believe we, we have things we have to address. We have to address them with the money that we have, just like you and I do. This is not a government money issue. This is our money as Americans. It is our tax dollars, and we need to decide how we're going to spend it. Right now, we have spent we have spent so far in debt that it is it is bordering on and soon will become a, a national crisis. It will become a defense crisis because other nations own our debt we won't be able to pay. So I, I advocate cuts in spending. I advocate um, a streamlined tax system that is fair to everyone and has less loopholes and less exemptions, but it's very fair to families. We can't do this on the backs of the middle class. We just can't. We can't raise taxes in an economic downturn like we're in right now. We're certainly improving, but we're not there yet. So I don't have the answer yet, but uh, it's going to take a combination of those things. It's going to take a long-term commitment to do it over a period of time. This can't be fixed overnight. It can't be fixed in one term. It can't be fixed in two terms. We didn't get here overnight, and we're not going to get out of this overnight. What's your thought on President Biden's proposal to increase taxes on corporations and wealthy Americans? Well, I think the devil's going to be in the details. I'm not, I'm not in favor of penalizing people for their success. I, uh, I think a streamlined tax system is a better way to do it. I think I've always been a fan of a flat tax with a high exemption. Uh, so that families, working, working people and uh, struggling families don't have near the burden as someone else. And yet a uh, flat tax um, hits us all evenly, right? 10% is 10%, 5% is 5%. No loopholes, no exemptions. I think that alone would increase revenue. 
Um, I don't support increasing taxes on businesses to pay for things that we won't even get for 10 or 15 years. I think that that is a wrong-headed idea because what that does is it, it translates to lost wages, lost jobs, lost expansion. And this is precisely the time we need to be increasing expansion, increasing jobs, and increasing the um, employment ability of businesses. So I think that these are um, gimmicks, if you will. They are uh, math uh, exercises, probably is the right word, to get us to a point where it justifies this massive amount of spending that is proposed in this infrastructure bill. Wanted to ask you just about the COVID relief bill. I know it passed in both houses, but how would you have voted on that? Well, it would have pained me greatly. Um, COVID is a very um, heartstring issue with me. I had it, my mother had it, Ron had it, and Ron lost his battle with it. Uh, there is desperately needed relief in some sectors for COVID, but that bill only spent 9% of the money on COVID relief. Everything else was, was issues that were not related to COVID at all. So uh, I would have been a no vote. I would have absolutely been a no vote. And that's tragic because both sides wanted the relief and we could have done that. The previous Congress could have done that, but it was a lack of will and uh, political um, obstacles that, that prevented it. I wanted to ask you about some of the election bills. Well, the election bill in Congress, I know states like Texas and Georgia, their election bills have certainly garnered uh, national attention, but I wanted to ask you what Congress would uh, is considering, and that's H.R. 1. The House passed it, but it goes to the Senate. And um, I'm wondering, how would you have voted on that? Well, H.R. 1 is supposed to be um, an attempt to strengthen our elections, to give more certainty to it, and, and give transparency. But unfortunately, the Constitution doesn't give Congress the right to do that. The Constitution specifically states that elections are to be run by state. So um, I, prob I, I would not have supported that, despite a few things in it that are, that are probably um, good to look at. But look, the states need to do this, and we need to hold the states accountable. Since the election, courts have ruled in several instances that some of these states exceeded their authority and actually violated their own election laws. That is not a way to ensure that people have confidence in the outcome of their elections. Um, and I think that that's what we need to do. Look, I've been an elections judge. I spent 20 years as an elections judge until Ron was on the ballot and I was no longer able to do it. It was paramount to me that the people who voted in my polling station were confident that their vote counted, their vote was accurate, and that they could have confidence that the outcome of the election at our polling place was true and, and accurate. And we did that. We did it every time. We did it for I don't even know how many elections in 20 years. We did it for, for all of the elections during that period of time. We counted the ballots, we audited the ballots, and we had our numbers match the machines. We did it every time. That's what people want. People wanna know, no matter what the outcome is, that everything was counted, it was above board, it was accurate, and there's no room for question. When you give any type of uncertainty into the election process, that's when you create uncertainty. That's when people begin to doubt everything about it. If you can't trust one thing, how can you trust the rest of it? So I think that uh, whatever good intentions were, were put into the creation of HR 1, first of all, it was created without any Republican input. And believe it or not, the Republicans represent virtually half of the country. So those people's voices matter too. And secondly, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't follow the constitutional mandate that states do this. And thirdly, it wouldn't do one thing to ensure transparency or surety in our election process. I wanted to ask you uh, two other issues real quick. And that is uh, one thing that we are hearing more about after the mass uh, shootings is more gun restrictions. Where do you fall on that? Well, I wouldn't be supportive of that. The gun restrictions, simply restrict law-abiding citizens. There is an underlying reason for these mass shootings and it is not a gun. The gun is the instrument that people are using. So I would, I would not support any further restrictions on guns. And then wanted to ask you about pol uh, police reform uh, as far as transparency, as far as training is concerned and even discussions about uh, making 
uh, taking away uh, immunity from police officers so that they could be sued for their actions. Your thoughts? Well, I support um, our men and women in blue 100%. They are their front, they are our frontline defense. When we call 911, when we have a problem, they are right there to take care of us. So I support them. They, they leave their homes every day, not sure if they're going to come back, come back or not. Their families bear this. There's no question that we need some more training, and certainly in certain areas. Uh, I do not support defunding the police in any form whatsoever. And uh, any bad actors, of course, should be addressed, but uh, I would support our men and women in blue 100%. Susan Wright, Republican candidate for the 6th Congressional District here in North Texas. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jack. My pleasure.